everyone. Great to have you with us. I'm your host, Nugwa Haruna. Many investors recognize the importance of having an investment plan. The financial markets may rise and fall, but our portfolio strategy can help us stay focused on our long-term goals. The thing is, years when the markets go haywire like they did in 2022 can really test our resolve. Just ask investors with the 60-40 portfolio. The asset mix is designed to deliver a moderate level of risk, volatility, and return that some investors may find suitable to their needs. But in 2022, it experienced one of its worst performances in over 30 years by many measures. So some investors may be rethinking their commitment to the 60-40 portfolio. Well, they may be reason for optimism with the strategy if history is any guide. For a closer look, we're joined by Sir Nanthan Taramakul Singham, Senior Strategist at Vanguard Canada. Welcome to the program. Nice to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Nagua. Um, I really appreciate uh, this opportunity to kind of defend the 60-40 portfolio and see how it may fit for investors going forward. Oh, looking forward to this. So um, can you share a little bit about what your role is at Vanguard? Yeah, sure. As a senior strategist, you know, it's a vague title, but really at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is is help advisors and portfolio managers um, ensure that their portfolio is a little bit all weather, right? A lot of times, whether you're an advisor or you're an individual investor, you tend to have biases that you may not see. And really my role is to see how you can round out those exposures and ensure that your portfolio is really meeting the needs and the goals that you've set out for your clients, or as if you're an end investor, what your personal investment goals would be. All right. Okay. So uh, before we get into the heart of our conversation, I do have a trivia question for our audience. And the question goes, when was the 60-40 portfolio invented? So stick around until the end of our conversation to hear the answer. Okay, Sir Nathan, let's hop into our conversation. And as we start off, let's uh, recap some of the basics of portfolio construction. So first off, how would an investor know what sort of portfolio might be right for them? Yeah, Nagu, I think one of the most important things to consider when you're creating a portfolio is your personal risk tolerance, right? Your risk tolerance is your ability to accept investment losses in exchange for the possibility of earning higher investment returns. So you may have heard of recommendations on how you start uh, with a number and really a commonly cited rule of thumb is subtracting your age from 110 to determine what portion of your portfolio should be dedicated to stock investments. But I do want to just caveat that your risk tolerance is not only tied to how much time you have before your financial goal, such as retirement, but also your ability to mentally handle watching the market rise and fall. The other thing to keep in mind is your investment objective, you know, I mentioned retirement, but it could be a variety of milestones as well as a variety of needs. Some investors want their portfolio to grow. Some investors may want their portfolio to provide consistent income. And one way to help understand how to build an appropriate portfolio for you would be to take an investor profile questionnaire that you can find through several firms and brokerages. And this brief questionnaire will ask you questions about your investment knowledge, your age, your goals, your horizon, and your risk tolerance, amongst other factors. You know, I will have to caveat that it's important to do some of your research to ensure that you understand how these various financial products work. And in some cases, it might be worthwhile to talk to an investment advisor to help guide your research. And I love that you mentioned that there's different objectives that investors could be working towards, right? It's not just retirement. Um, and I just wanted to give a heads up to our audience that TD offers a, a free investor profile questionnaire that you mentioned that investors can check out online to figure out which portfolio strategy might suit them. And for clients who utilize web broker, they can also use the goals tool, which would help them uh, when it comes to choosing the right asset mix to, to fit whatever their investment objective may be. It could be retirement. It could be saving money for a large purchase or just to make money. So once an investor understands what their priority is, they can start to build a portfolio that best suits them. So what are some of the elements of a well-designed portfolio? Yeah, the most common types of investment products in a portfolio would be equities and fixed income, right? So stocks and bonds. And so what are these? Stocks are a tiny slice of ownership in a company. An investor buys a stock that they believe will go up in value over time. The risk, of course, is that may not happen, right? The stock may not go up in time, and in fact, it may actually lose some value. Bonds, on the other hand, are loans to companies and governments that are paid back over time with interest. Bonds are considered to be safer investments than stocks, but they generally have lower returns. And, you know, we use the 
term fixed income interchangeably. And it's because you'll receive an interest from investing in bonds. And that's kind of where you have that fixed income because you understand what you'll receive on an ongoing basis. And once you have the idea of the common types that you want to invest in or the combination of stocks and bonds, it comes down to how you go about investing in. And we've all heard the adage, not putting all your eggs in one basket. And I think this concept applies to managing investments as well. And this is where diversification really matters. And really what it means is allocating your money among different asset classes and different asset categories to help manage risk. Diversification in itself doesn't guarantee any investment risk or eliminate the risk of loss, but it really helps mitigate company specific risks that you might have if you were to invest in just one name. All right. So um, so what do investors need to keep in mind when considering their portfolio strategy? Yeah. I think the first thing to, to really think about is market timing and how extremely difficult it is to time the market. Even for professional investors, it's likely to fail as a portfolio strategy. And in fact, what ends up happening is you end up buying high and selling low, which is counterintuitive and counterproductive to your long-term goals. And so I would say it's important to stay focused on your long-term goals as an investor instead of reacting to short-term developments. And so when you're building your portfolio, you want to make sure you have one that you're comfortable with the risk that you're ultimately going to take. Because it's important to remember that the markets can be volatile. And this means even diversified portfolios, right, a combination of stocks and bonds can have uneven returns. You'll have years where you have very high returns, and then you'll have years where you have low returns, similar to what we're seeing in 2022, where there could be negative returns. And I think successful investing over a longer term really demands perspective and long-term discipline, right? Stretches like the beginning of 2022 and some bear markets that have lasted much longer really test an investor's patience. And so that's why it's beneficial to have a set allocation in mind that you can come back to and keep your long-term goals into perspective. I love that we're able to tie this back to our very first question about an investor actually going over that um, investor questionnaire because it lets them do things like that time horizon that you mentioned. Now, if I know my time horizon is 20 years and five years into my investing, uh, there's a bear market. Well, based on, uh, you know, his historical returns of the markets. I do know that they will be dips, they will be rises, but I may still be on track to accomplish that objective. So uh, it, it's so much easier to stick to what your plan is by setting a plan before you actually start investing, knowing what your, your asset allocation is. All right. So, uh, Sir Nathan, now let's talk about stocks and bonds because they tend to be the key building blocks for many portfolio strategies. What are some of the main factors that drive the performances of these two asset classes? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a lot here, so I'll try to keep this as uh, brief as possible. And, and let's start with fixed income, right? And so fixed income securities are driven by a few factors. The first one is around interest rate changes. So as interest rates rise, the price of bonds generally fall because now investors can buy bonds at a higher interest rate. So the existing bonds have less value to them overall. And the reverse is true as well, right? When interest rates come down, existing bonds are a little bit more um, higher in terms of their value. The other thing I'll kind of highlight there is bonds with longer maturity are subject to greater price movement upon interest rate changes. The other uh, factor that might affect fixed income securities is really around credit and default risk. Because remember, bonds are just a loan. So there's a risk that the issuer will go out of business and unable to pay the interest rate and the principles that they um, had taken out on the loan from you, right? So that's one thing to consider. And really, issuers of high yield bonds will have more credit risk. They're more likely to default. And so generally, you'll see high yield bonds pay a little bit higher interest to compensate for that risk that investors will have. And finally, it's around liquidity risk. Sometimes investors need to exit a bond position and you might have a limited secondary market to sell that bond to. Now on the stock side of things, stock prices are really determined in the marketplace where seller supply meets buyer demand. And the return of equities is driven by a lot of fundamental factors. So when you buy a stock, like we mentioned, you're purchasing a proportional share of the entire future stream of earnings. So this is sometimes expressed in things like price to earnings or price to sales. So that's really the fundamental factors that drive stock prices. And I tell you, things would be very easy if fundamental factors are the only things that uh, drive stock prices, but there's also technicals, right? 
We're seeing this this year with inflation. There's also just the competition of any stock, the economic circumstances, there's news and corporate developments. And another big factor that drives stocks is investor sentiment, right? Sometimes investors get a little bit, um, they get more risk averse than they initially anticipate they would be. And so you'll see some selling that happens there. And historically, stocks and bonds have tended to be negatively correlated. And so when one goes up, the other one comes down and vice versa. All right. So when we talk about a negative correlation between stocks and bonds, what exactly do we mean when we say that? Yeah. So when we're saying negatively correlated or positively correlated, we're just saying the direction they move together, right? So if what, something is negatively correlated to something else, one will go up while the other one will come down, generally speaking, and the magnitude of that is the, the extreme of that negative correlation. Whereas if something's positively correlated, you know, if stocks go up, bonds will also go up. And so it's really, you know, when we're talking about diversification and how we want to make sure that our portfolio is well balanced, we would want stocks to go up while bonds coming down and vice versa, because otherwise there's no point of having some allocation to stocks and some allocations to bonds if they both move in the same direction. And so that's really around the idea of negative correlation and how correlation matters inside of an investment portfolio. For those of us in our audience who want to learn more about understanding your investor profile and the basics of building a portfolio, you're able to check out our video course, Managing a Portfolio in the Learning Center on WebBroker and on our YouTube page. So now this brings us to the 60-40 portfolio. What are some of the factors that have made it such a common approach in asset allocation. Yeah, the 60-40 portfolio. And here when we're saying 60-40, we're, we're really re referring back to the fact that 60% of that portfolio will be stocks, 40% will be bonds. But a lot of what I'm going to say here probably applies to a lot of different balanced portfolios, whether that's 50% equities, 50% stocks, 70% 30, right? It's just this general allocation of 40 to 70% equities really thought to be a moderate risk profile. And when you look at a good balance fund, it really does three things, right? The first one is to provide downside protection. And this is the addition of bonds in your portfolio. And when you do that, you won't see the 40 and 50% drops that you'll see tied to just the equity markets. So that's a, a very important cornerstone of a balance fund. The second thing, it allows you to participate in market upswings. So your allocation to equities will really help get you closer to your investment goals by getting returns through your equities, as well as the income that you get on the fixed income side. And finally, I think a good balanced portfolio allows you to stay invested in the market. And again, 2022 is one of those situations where it really tests your patience, but going to cash may not help you in your long run, especially when you have an investment goal that might be a couple of years out. As an investor, why has it been popular? Well, it helps you automate your investments. It removes the need to tinker with your portfolio. It frees up time and really the mental burden of managing your portfolio on an ongoing basis. And it gets you to have a strategic allocation that's right. And at Vanguard, we've done quite a bit of studies and I know a lot of other asset managers and financial institutions have done similar studies to show the impact of asset allocation on portfolio performance. And we've seen regardless of the market that you do the study, whether it's here in Canada, whether it's the US, Australia or UK, 80 to 90% of return variation is explained by your strategic allocation. So getting a right balance fund is the first step to getting you to your investment goals overall. You know, why has it been very popular? It's been successful. If you look at the returns of a 60-40 portfolio uh, back to 1926 to 2021, on average, it's delivered about 8.8%. Uh, if an investor has a 60-40 portfolio, it's designed to tamper risk and volatility to some degree but it has experienced one of the worst years on record in 2022. So why has this asset mix underperformed so sharply? Yeah, Nico, that is the, the million dollar question, right? It's, it's one that we, we tend to have with our advisors. And, and, and typically, right, you'll see that negative correlation between stocks and bonds. So we talked about this, when stocks go up, bonds go down and vice versa. And that's usually how that relationship works. But we've really been caught in the perfect storm of negative market drivers, which have pushed both stocks and bonds down simultaneously. And this comes with, from the fact that we're really in a tough time where central banks that would generally cut interest rates when the economy is struggling to help support a rebound, they're not doing that right now because inflation has spiked so high. Right. And when inflation spikes high, central banks have tools that are available to them. And the most commonly used tool is to increase interest rates, knowing that this tends to hurt the 
economic growth that you'll see in the economy. And it's the lesser of two evils. We know what inflation can do in the long run. And so it's the, the primary objective of central banks to reduce inflation as much as possible. And that comes with higher interest rates. And when we think about this, it intuitively makes sense why both bonds and stocks are suffering at the same time. We talked about higher interest rates mean lower bond prices, but higher interest rates also constrict the economy. It makes it harder for some companies to grow. It limits economic activities, right? So ultimately, all of that is not really good for stock prices going forward because that growth component and that earnings component of a stock is really going to be constricted going forward with higher interest rates. Now, some market watchers in the media say the dynamic we saw in 2022 illustrates why the 60-40 portfolio is no longer credible. What's the rationale as you see it? I think first, you know, saying the 60-40 is dead is a, it's a very controversial thing. It'll catch a lot of headlines. So it's easy to say the 60-40 is dead, but I'll, I'll tell you the the data really doesn't back this up, right? And, and my fear is it also, it encourages short-term trading. And we just already talked about how keeping a long-term perspective in mind is really important for investors to get their ultimate objectives. Um, so if I'm looking at their rationale, it's it's really, it'll come down to a few things, right? Critics might point to lower yields in fixed income and they'll say, you know, this is what we experienced in recent decades and there's no income in fixed income. So there's no merit for fixed income in your portfolio or they may be drawing from market dynamics from the 70s and 80s, similar to what we've been seeing in 2022 of higher inflation and periods of negative returns for both stocks and bonds. I think what a lot of people forget is bonds eventually helped hedge against equity performance and provided other diversification benefits. And to me, when I hear the 60-40 is dead, it's it's really an indictment on, on the bonds component of this, right? No one complains when, when stocks are down. And I think a lot of that is driven because people forget that bonds have several objectives in a 60-40 portfolio. And not all of them are evident at the same time, right? Ultimately, you want to have bonds in your 60-40 or your balance fund for four reasons. Income, right? That's a primary function of fixed income. You want to make sure that you can fund any intermittent uh, spending needs that you might have. Return. And this is where people uh, should invest in bonds or should consider bonds instead of cash because bonds do have ultimate returns to you as an investor. So you'll have that component to help get to your ultimate investment goal. Diversification, and this goes back to the negative correlations, really bonds help provide a buffer when equities don't do well. And ultimately, it's this idea of liquidity, right? When things aren't doing well, you don't want to sell from your equity positions and bonds are highly liquid. So you're able to sell from your bonds to help fund any emergency that you might have. So when you consider that as a whole, there's really four objectives of bonds that, that really come through in a 60-40 portfolio. So that said, Sarnathan, the Vanguard team doesn't believe the 60-40 portfolio is dead. In fact, you say it may be more viable than it has been in recent years. Why is that? Yeah, Nugu, let me start off by saying, you know, brief simultaneous declines in stocks and bonds have happened before, and they're not entirely unusual, right? And we've looked at this. So when you look at the data, and we have monthly data going back 50 years to 1976, stocks and investment grade bonds have been negative together in any one month period about 15% of the time. So in other words, you know, once in every seven months, both stocks and bonds will be negative. But when you stretch that period out, stocks and bonds have only been negative together about 0.4% of the time in any one year period. And additionally, there's never been a three year period where both stocks and bonds have been negative. And so when you look at it from a context of a 60-40 portfolio, you know, we see negative returns about 14% of the time in a one year period. So once in every seven years, you'll see this on average. And all of this I'm saying is to really underscore the point that negative returns is not unusual. So for when pundits come out and say 60, 40 is dead because of a negative year, they're really ignoring 50 years of data. And so that kind of gives you the, the historical context here. And then when we look at why we're in the situation, we discussed this a bit around inflation and central banks, but when we look at the relationship of stocks and bonds in all environments, increasing inflation expectations and decreasing infl inflation expectations, we see a few things. Generally, the negative relationships between bonds and stocks hold. It's only in increasing inflation expectations where this relationship tends to turn positive. And it goes back to some of the things we discussed, which is ultimately what happens is 
when you have high inflation, the central banks, whether it's the Bank of Canada or other central banks, are forced to increase interest rates, which can negatively impact both stocks and bonds. But generally speaking, we're going to have more instances where there's decreasing inflation expectations. Generally, the market doesn't expect inflation to go up. And so when critics and skeptics will say the 60-40 is dead, it's really, they're cherry picking those very small instances where this occurs, right? And so for me, the solace is twofold. And I kind of mentioned this already, that relationship between stocks and bonds tends to be negative more often than not. And the instances where it's positive, it's few and far between. And the second thing, you know, at Vanguard, we believe while inflation is sticky and elevated, we don't expect increasing inflation expectations. So that normal dynamic between bonds and stocks should have a negative correlation going forward. And the, the other thing I'll also mention is, you know, it hasn't been a great year for bonds, but they do perform well when yields are high and stay and rates are stabilizing and falling. Right. And I think we're kind of getting to that position. Um, and then when you think about yields in itself, they're higher than they were in their equilibrium. So it's a good time in terms of bond yields and longer dated bonds are great diversifiers ahead of a market recession. You know, bonds can often help diversify a portfolio when economic growth is slowing. And so when you couple all those things together, the historical context, why we're here right now, what we expect going forward, I think the 60-40 is incredibly viable for a lot of, um, for a lot of investors that have that risk profile. All right. So it, we're saying that uh, that relationship, that positive uh, relationship between the bonds and the stocks tends to be an exception as opposed to the rule. And so therefore shouldn't be used as a basis to say the 60-40 portfolio is dead, if I'm understanding. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So uh, some investment professionals have expressed concern that the 60-40 may not provide high enough income to last throughout the investor's retirement years now that people are generally le uh, living longer. So what do you think about this concern? Yeah, Nago, this also comes up quite often. And I would say this critique probably was a bit more appropriate uh, a few years ago and not really in the current market. Right. We, we talked about this already. Um, higher interest rates higher rates in general, the fixed income component is now paying more than it had in the past. So investment grade bonds are producing coupons in most cases that can really help fund retirement spending fairly well, right? And we talked about how it's been a tough year for bonds, but really this is the silver lining in this market turmoil. A lot of portfolios shifted towards more aggressive assets to get that yield, but that's not really warranted anymore because of where yields are within fixed income and bond investing. And so you have to consider your place in your investing journey, your investor profile and your goals. But if you're rearing, nearing retirement, de-risking may be more prudent for reaching those high yields now that fixed income is paying what you want them to pay for retirement spending. And then, you know, anecdotally, I can tell you, at Vanguard, our target date funds shift their equity portion to 30% in many cases in their retirement years, right? So based off our research, it's, it's really what seems to be appropriate. And it will come with the caveat that it depends on your lifestyle and spending expectations. But this idea that fixed income is not going to pay you enough because you're living longer is less valid now that you have those interest rates that will really help pay the coupon that you need to sustain your, your living environment, right? Some investors might look to so-called alternative investments, such as private equity funds, commodities, or real estate to help boost the returns of a 60-40 portfolio. What might they want to consider before making any investment decisions? Yeah, the first thing I would say is it's important to understand your investor profile and not take any action that puts you outside of your risk tolerance, right? And the reason why I say this is because alternatives it's such a broad category and every sub asset class can behave quite differently. So it's important to do extensive research first. But if we're talking about alternatives that can help provide negative correlation to stocks and bonds, you know, you could consider alternatives like private equity or real estate. They may help increase returns. But one thing I want to call out is, you know, when it comes to negative correlation, just remember, it's not just when your asset class is negatively correlated, but does it justify a position in your portfolio through positive real returns? An example that I often use is the US dollar is uncorrelated to stocks, but should I hold 20% US dollars, that might not help me get to my investment goal. I'll take it one step further. Sugarcane prices are uncorrelated to equities. And you know, I'm a big proponent of sugarcane juice, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna have 20% of my portfolio in sugarcane because it's negatively correlated because there's no real positive real return that you'll get there. 
Now, for investors who are looking for alternatives to add income, you know, I, I would say that you can potentially enhance total return by looking at higher dividend stocks or corporate debt. But what I would stress is we wouldn't want to replace your bond component with these alternatives. We think it's better to take away from your equity allocation rather than your bond allocation because you don't want to risk skewing your profile of the risk tolerance that you're comfortable taking. And so for investors looking at alternatives, I would say consider not taking away from the stable aspect of your portfolio, and maybe you want to remove some of your equity allocation to help fund alternatives overall. Now, strategies like the 60-40 portfolio often require some level of rebalancing as the performance of asset classes vary over time. So I wanted to pause our conversation for a moment to show our viewers how they can use the asset allocation tool in WebBroker to keep tabs on it all. Investors who have specific asset class weightings they're looking to maintain in their portfolio may have to periodically review and rebalance their holdings. Alternatively, investors also have asset allocation investment funds available to them. And you're able to find these funds under Research. Under Investments, we'll click on ETFs. Once here, scroll down, focusing on the right side of the screen, and click on ETF Category. Click on the drop down to view the different asset allocation ETFs. These funds allocate a specific amount of fixed income and equities depending on the fund's goal, and most asset allocation funds have a stated target for the amounts invested in these asset classes. For our example, we're going to choose allocation 50 to 70% equity. There's 21 matches. Scrolling down, select View 21 Matches. Once here, investors are able to see the 21 exchange-traded funds that hold between 50 to 70% in equities. For investors looking to dig a little deeper, you can select a specific exchange-traded fund and click on Summary. Once here, scroll down, focusing on the left side of the screen, and the investor is able to see what the asset class weighting is for that specific exchange-traded fund. For an investor looking to reevaluate their portfolio holdings by asset class, they're able to do this using the asset allocation tool. Click on accounts. Under account details, click asset allocation. Once here, an investor can see the breakdown in terms of the asset allocation for that specific portfolio. They can see how much they're holding in equities, in fixed income, cash and cash equivalents, and other, which comprises of options, physical commodities, hedge funds, and structured products. Investors who are looking for some more details into the asset allocation tool are able to find additional information by clicking on the question mark on the right side of the screen there. Scroll down to see additional information about the asset allocation tool. Okay, hopefully that demo helps our viewers stay on track with their desired portfolio strategy, whatever it may be. So we're gonna to have to end our conversation uh, right here, Sananthan. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your perspective on the 60-40 portfolio. I think keeping the bigger picture in mind through the ups and downs of the markets can help investors stay focused on their financial goals. Now, before we go, let's reveal the answer to our trivia question. As a refresher, the question was, when was the 60-40 portfolio invented? And the answer is, the 60-40 portfolio was conceptualized back in 1952 as part of Nobel Prize winning economist Harry Markowitz's work on modern portfolio theory. However, the 60-40 portfolio strategy was popularized by Vanguard founder John Vogel in the 1990s. And I like that it's now called the balanced uh, portfolio, right? Where it doesn't have to strictly be 60% and 40%. You mentioned earlier, it could be 70-30, it could be more 50-50. So finding some kind of balance uh, is the idea behind the 60-40 portfolio, right? Yeah, exactly. Because balance to everyone is different, right? And so balance to me might be very different than balance to you, but it really allows you to get the benefits of both of those asset classes in a meaningful allocation to, to allow you to do what you think is most appropriate for your investment goals. And so, yeah, I like to always 
you know, decouple that a little bit and say the 60 40 is, is an allocation that's recommended for certain investors, but it may not be recommended for all investors. So keep that in perspective when you're building out your strategic allocation. All right. So uh, thanks again for joining us. And for those in our audience, make sure to register for our upcoming live webinars and check out our library of on demand content available in the Learning Center and on our YouTube page. See you next time.